We're going to meet in the choir room for a lesson. To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. Now, when I was growing up, I loved this Old Testament story, you know, this Sunday school story, really, in my (laughs) mind at that time, about this place, magical place, almost, it seemed, of Jericho. There was a story of spies, and, you know, is this mystery, and what's going to happen, what's going on, but really, the part that, that stood out to me the most, really, was the song. You know, the, the, the song about Jericho. Some, some of you might know it. It's, you know, Joshua fought the battle at Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle at Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. See, some of you do know it. Didn't even have to sing it. Now, that Old Testament story, like I said, it was about more than just the walls coming tumbling down. But as a kid in Sunday school, that's the part that stood out to me was that song. And so all these years later, whenever I hear Jericho referenced, like in today's gospel that we just heard proclaimed, my mind immediately goes to that old, well-beloved African-American spiritual that turned into a Sunday school chart topper. I mean, just hit the, <laughs> at least the top 100, maybe the top 10. But Jericho was a place known for the walls coming tumbling down, well, at least for that. It's a place where God's people responded to the Lord's call, where they walked around the city with horns, with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord in that place. And they would do this day after day after day. And finally, finally, one day, the walls came tumbling down. Jericho was a place that was familiar with God's power, where God's people had known that they could ask for the Lord's will and that they might see his miraculous power. So this is where this city, Jericho, centuries later, Jesus and his disciples show up as they're on their journey, where our gospel picks up today. And we hear that as they were leaving the city of Jericho, blind Bartimaeus was there on the roadside. Now, we don't know much about blind Bart before this point, but clearly he had heard of Jesus. He had heard of who Jesus was and what Jesus was able to do. So when this blind beggar heard the crowds passing by and he hears members of the crowd say that it's about this Jesus guy, he just just begins shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And again and again and more loudly and loudly, he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. These Jesus followers, like many in that city, had likely been doing all along. They were just trying to shush him, to say, no, be quiet, stay over there. But he was determined. That encouraged him even more loudly to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Remember, he was blind. He didn't know if this large crowd, he didn't know if Jesus was three feet from him or 30 feet or 300 feet. I mean, it would have been quite the crowd. He couldn't see where Jesus was, so he was shouting, hoping that somewhere in the crowd would be this Jesus he had heard about. He believed that this Jesus, this Messiah, the son of David, that he is this long-awaited one, this anointed one who would come and be the savior of the world. So Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus heard blind Bart's cries. The gospel says he stops in his tracks. Well, it says he stood still. He stopped in his tracks. But Jesus stood still and said, call him here. So those ones who had been trying to silence him, tell him, hush, hush, hush. They were the ones that were sent with the message. That were sent to go over to him and say, take heart, get up. He's calling you. Can you just imagine the overwhelming sense of joy and disbelief that this is even happening and the courage that it takes and everything else that was swimming through Blind Bart's mind. But as we hear in the gospel, he throws off his cloak and he springs up 
and he goes over to Jesus. But remember, he's still blind. So I imagine him stumbling and bumping up against people, or maybe relying on people, hoping that they are leading him to this Jesus that he's heard so much about. Again, he can't see. How would he know? He hopes, and sure enough, the person they lead him to is, in fact, this Jesus. And when he gets there, Jesus doesn't just throw some magic dust his way and keep on walking. Jesus stopped there. He had a conversation with him. He acknowledged the dignity and the humanity of this blind beggar. And then Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, blind Bart could have asked for anything. But he said, my teacher, let me see again. My teacher, let me see again. He knows Jesus to be the teacher, this one who knows the way of God. And he knows, he knows that this Jesus has the power of God to make him see. And in that final word, again, we get the sense that perhaps Bart hasn't been blind all along. Perhaps something happened that caused him to lose his sight. So it's then no wonder that he had been crying out, or mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was asking for what seemed like a painful punishment to be taken away from him, to have his slate wiped clean. He was praying for mercy. My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Then what do we hear next? St. Mark, the very next word he has there says, immediately, immediately Bartimaeus regained his sight. Right then and there. And Jesus said, go. Blind Bart, well, was no longer blind Bart. He was seeing Bart. But again, that isn't the end of the story. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Now, Jesus hadn't put a condition on it. He hadn't said, well, if I heal you, you have to follow me. Jesus hadn't even said, now, since I've done this wonderful thing for you, won't you go and tell everyone who it was that did this? Tell them about this miracle worker. No, Jesus says, go. Your faith has made you well. So Bartimaeus, he could have done anything, could have gone anywhere, seen all new sights or seen sights that he hadn't seen for who knows how long. He had just met Jesus. He had just encountered this Savior of the world, this chosen one who shows and knows the way of God. So he takes his regained sight and he follows Jesus on the way. Now, what way was that? Jesus, if we had been sitting here and reading all of Mark's gospel, we would have heard, was on his way to Jerusalem. And actually, the very next verse after where our gospel today um, cuts off, that very next verse is where it says Jesus is entering Jerusalem. It's that Palm Sunday story that we hear each and every year of Jesus' triumphal entry, you know, where he comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and people are waving palms and singing Hosanna. It was Jesus on his way to die. It was Jesus making his way to suffer in Jerusalem and to die for the sake of the whole world, to freely offer this kind of divine mercy to any and all. To make a way for new life, for true life. Life that is far greater than any of the powers of this world that blind and cripple and steal and hurt and grieve and impoverish. Jesus was on his way to the cross, on his way then to the tomb, and his way into resurrected life, in this way that any who would follow him can, can follow him into into this eternal life. 
this is the way that blind Bart immediately followed in when he regained his sight. After Jesus had restored his vision. Bart used his vision given by the Lord for the sake of the gospel. For the good news of new life. For it to be spread wherever Jesus was going, far and wide, so that many more would come and join in amongst this large crowd of disciples following Jesus, following him all the way to the cross and all the way then into resurrected life. We at St. James, we're in a process of praying for vision. We're in this season of stewardship and discernment. We're asking everyone to pray, to ask God to give us a vision, a new vision for ministry in this time and in this place. And so we're in the process of sharing information with one another about our common life, about asking the questions of who is God calling us to be? What is God calling us to do? We're in a season of asking Jesus to give us a new vision for our ministry as we follow him where he leads. And like the city of Jericho, we're familiar with some walls coming down. I mean, just in the last couple of years, this 60-year-old church building has seen far more than its fair share of crumbling walls and issues. I mean, in just the last few weeks, we've had part of the roof and the middle part of the spire right in here repaired so that it wouldn't be raining on us when we gathered on a Sunday morning. And even right now, we have part of the basement somewhat gutted because we're restoring and renovating the children's area brought on in part by floodwaters from a storm and years of wear and tear. But also more than just physical walls, we're familiar with the miraculous power of God that tears down the walls that divide us. St. James has become a, this community that is known for being welcoming. I hadn't prepared to share this, but in the uh, search process, when I was interviewing with the search committee a year and a half or so ago to become the rector here, I kept asking, what's St. James known for? And everyone kept saying, well, we're just the most welcoming place. And I kept saying, yeah, every church says that. Every church wants to be that. But then I got here, and St. James is the most welcoming place. I don't know how else to say it. But this is a place. It is a place of welcome where young and old and traditional and progressive and every gender identity and health status and ability and income, where everyone is welcomed. It's the most inclusive community I've known, where personally I share love and supportive relationships with those who have vastly different views than myself. This is a place where we've been committed to loving one another and to not let the dividing walls of the world come in and pit us against each other to keep us from loving one another. We're called in this world to be an image, an image of this place where we don't have walls that divide us, where all of us together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as fellow children of God, can come together and to know the miraculous power of God in our midst in a world that so desperately needs that kind of miraculous healing and message. And as a parish, we've been doing this for a while. And we've gone through different seasons where there have been different emphases, different things going on. New ministries started, old ones um, being put to rest for a time. As we've mentioned over the last few weeks and in letters from me and others, our community has shifted. The world has shifted. We've buried loved ones from our parish. We've welcomed new ones into the parish. It's a new day. And so because it is a new day, it is time. It is time again to ask for a renewed vision, for God to give us a new vision for what ministry looks like here and now. If Blind Bart had 
been seeing before he became blind, when he regained his sight, I'm sure some things might have looked a little, might have looked the same. And other things might have looked a little different. A bit of continuity, but all as we are following in the way. And so that's why we as a parish are undergoing similarly this process of seeing things anew of asking God to give us a vision of hearing Jesus say, what can I do for you? And responding, my teacher, let me see again. Give us a new vision. It's a time when, like today after the service, as a a preview of things to come, in our parish forum, we'll be talking about our vision, the visions that God is giving us for ministry. Not that we're going to solve all of that today and walk out of here with, you know, a three to five year strategic plan. I don't anticipate any of that today. It's part of our conversations, it's part of our common life where we are coming together and knowing and loving, again, without the walls that divide us, who God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do. And so participate, join in today and coffee hour in the visions and values conversation. Phil, I think I've got one of these stuck in here somewhere. The uh, pledge and planning form, I've got more copies out in the narthex if you don't have one, that asks lots of questions like my prayer for our parish is, from your experience, what are our parish's strengths? What do you think God's vision for our parish looks like? How might we grow into this vision? And this is not all of the work. It's a part of a process that will continue on until we say this is the vision God has given us. But it takes us crying out, asking, asking for a new vision. So may we all, like blind Bart, call out to God. May we all, like blind Bart, be given new sight and a new vision. And may we come to know and follow each and every day in the way of Jesus through the cross and into new life. Amen. Amen.